Hello, my name is Rico C. Soko, and I uh, live in Morningside Heights here in Manhattan, and I'm going to read an excerpt from my novel. It's called uh, People of Color. For having so little idea of what the hell she wanted from life, Cece was fairly confident in her ability to manage from day to day in her small village in the northern part of Ghana. She was lucky. Most of the town spoke English, unlike her friend Henry, who'd been assigned to the arid plains of Togo and who'd spent two months studying French before he could begin his work as a sexual health educator. She had another Peace Corps friend, Amanda, in a village a short bike ride away, who showed her what to buy on market days and when she'd run out of chlorine drops for making the filthy river water potable and how to convince the farmers in her village. Be subtle, Amanda said, talk and don't lecture, to participate in workshops for better crop fertilization or maintaining the soil well in the village. Cece was probably the least prepared of her cohort for two years in the Peace Corps. Earlier that day, Xavier approached as she swept the dirt floor of her hut. Xavier was her favorite, though. During the core orientation, she was told not to play favorites. She placed her broom aside, allowed him to take her hand in his little palm, asked what she nicknamed his question of the day. What are fortune cookies? Yesterday it was, how many of the United States have you visited? And her favorite from two months ago, Cece, why aren't you white? She had no idea how to respond to the boy's questions. Run and play, she said, had he started his chores. Later, she walked to Comfort's house. It was her favorite place in the village, even more than her embarrassingly palatial four-room home, the entire first floor of a British colonial house, and Xavier's mother was her closest friend. What would she do without Comfort? She was, in actual flesh and blood, all of Cece's feminist ideals. Common sense and intelligence, Cece had written her diary without all the, without all the trappings and bullshit, Bullshite, she'd written chickily in her diary of American higher education. It was something she never would have assumed before she arrived. Comfort had attended primary school for five years, fairly extensive in contrast to the other women in the village, and because she headed the WA Regional Women's Cooperative, was respected in the small village as an elder. She was not married to Xavier's father, who worked five weeks out of six in a fishing village near the touristy coast, visiting Comfort and their son every six weeks. Unlike Cece, Comfort never seemed to bother longing for a man. Your son stumped me this morning, Cece said to her friend. They held hands like schoolgirls instead of young women, chatting beneath the long branches that arched over Comfort's front gate. It was another small thing that Cece had grown to love. The lingering touch of Ghanaians, the way they held hands, women and women, women and men, men and men, sometimes for the length of a conversation, no matter if it was five minutes or half an hour. How the hell did Xavier learn about fortune cookies? Comfort raised her eyebrows. She hated when Cece swore. Comfort was God-fearing, Cece God-forsaking. Recently, their time had been occupied with peeling yams and pounding fufu, rather than attempts to understand one another. Cece wanted more, but their impasse seemed to suit Comfort just fine. The missionaries give him treats, huh? It is their way of talking to the children. Damn religious freaks. Cece followed Comfort into her compound, a trapezoid with four huts, one at each corner. Though she had asked Comfort, she still can't figure out the familial, familial relationships between everyone who lives here. Several middle-aged women, two teenage girls, prickly little Xavier, a few middle-aged men dressed in the same torn jeans and faded t-shirts, and a lonely old elderly man in the furthest hut. At first, Cece thought he was Comfort's brother. In her first few days, she remembered asking more questions, seeking more clarity, clarity in bloodlines and ages than she does now. But this morning, seeing him fiddle with a broken chain of a bicycle, she thinks he must be the grandfather. Cece pulled up a rickety stool next to Comfort and starts to husk the corn her friend has accumulated. People whose sole interest is in brainwashing ought to be banished from this country, Cece says. She looks up at Comfort for a response. Her friend gives a usual uh-huh and husks a cob in one efficient motion. Do you want Xavier to be a Jesus freak comfort? What if he abandons his studies, gets involved with all these evil people? Boy will do what boys will do. Comfort is crouching and now rises, her long dress falling from her thighs to ankle, and with a quick kick pushes away a goat nibbling on the pile of discarded husks. There's a combination of delicacy and willfulness to Comfort's mo movements that Cece admires. It doesn't bother you that they're brainwashing him? Comfort shakes her head. Miss Cece, I have to prepare for the cooperative meeting. She kiss kisses her oddly, quickly on the neck, 
Cece wonders if it's another one of those moments that she's committed some kind of gaffe. Every time she feels like she's achieved some kind of cultural competency, she gets knocked on her ass. When Cece will meet Amanda at the night market that evening, dodging calls of abrone, abrone from the local boys, lounging on motorcycles, and chewing barbecued pork on a stick, Cece will confide to her friend that she loves comfort more than her own mother. Amanda will hug her and tell her that it's only been a couple of months that she's homesick. Amanda will tell her friend with a dimple and a smile to seek therapy. The Peace Corps off offers it for free. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Vital Stern. I'm from Washington Heights in Manhattan. And I'm going to be reading a section of a story called Ex-Best Friend. The one thing you should know about him is he's an awful lover, she said. She was talking to her best friend, the woman who is currently sleeping with her ex-husband, who probably knew she was lying, that he was at the very worst a somewhat satisfactory lover, and that if she was being fair to him, to herself, to her own erotic past, was likely somewhat more satisfactory than that. She knew he was, he was currently sleeping with her, her best friend. She knew it, yet she continued to pretend it wasn't happening, that her best friend was simply her best friend, that they were eating brunch together as they always did, or usually did, or more recently, as they sometimes did, on Sunday mornings, when the kids were away at camp and the city was empty, as empty as the city ever got, and the village being the village was the village, and the sun was bright, and all was right with the world, except for the fact that her best friend was sleeping with the man she used to be married to. It wasn't supposed to happen this way. When she and her ex-husband were married, he had fantasized about her, her friend. He was open about his dreams, his fantasies. He had many of them. And she had played along, thinking it was something exciting about him. He was a writer, a poet. The poetry slightly worse than the prose, both exceedingly cute. It was not her style. A teacher at Brooklyn College, and she had envied and embraced his fantasies in the bedroom, as long as they remained fantasies. Then there was a fling with an MFA student, and the fantasy suddenly became real, and she had moved out. She was an attorney, she could afford to do so. And she had moved into a one-bedroom apartment on the Upper West Side, and her children had stayed with their father, and their father continued to, to conduct affairs, and then suddenly the affairs stopped, and the relationship, this relationship, started. The relationship between her ex-husband and her best friend, sitting across from her right now, eating a disgustingly rich tartine and prattling on about architecture while all she wanted to do was strangle her, tell her how awful she was making her feel, how worthless she felt. Now that the love of her life, her one true love, the man she should never have left, she should have indulged the fantasies to their extreme, let them become reality. She should have shut down those fantasies while they were still dreams. Stop letting him dream in the bedroom so his dreams would never become reality. These two conflicting, constantly taunting, taunting emotions flow through her not constantly anymore, but more often than she'd like to admit. And now, now that she was staring her, let's face it, ex-best friend in the face, seeing how happy she was, though she tried to hide it, the conflicting impulses battled inside her and she felt she had to scream. The story that she had left before she had found out about the affairs, that she had left to find herself, she had told this to her ex-best friends, but she had not expected her, the ex-best friends, to believe it. She had expected the lie to be seen for what in fact was, a bald, a bald faced method of dealing with the unfortunate truth that the truth was too impossible to think about, to imagine, so that the lie became reasonable, easy, in its own way true. She had left her husband because she could not live knowing that her husband put his penis in a woman other than her. That was the simple truth that she did not acknowledge this truth to anyone but herself, although she assumed, this is what every, everyone assumed, that this was the obvious truth lying just below the surface, was nobody's business but her own. And then, over coffee, over cappuccinos, cappuccinos, at the end of a meal, but the ex-best friend had ordered, and she, wanting to seem agreeable, had said, make it too. The bombshell dropped. The ex-best friend told her she was moving in with him, and just like that, the friendship was over. It simply wasn't worth it to go on pretending. It needed to end. It needed to end. Yet, it didn't end. What she should have said when she replayed the moments in her mind over the next few days, the next few weeks, was, how could, you do to, how could you do this to me? You knew that I loved him. I thought you were my friend. What she should have done was turned over the cup of cappuccino, still steaming, practically untouched, that was sitting on her plate before her so that it spilled onto her best ex-best friend's lap. She should have stood up, looked her ex-best friend in the face, told her she hated her, asked her how she could have done this to her, asked her to think about how this was making her feel, not letting her respond before stomping away in a huff, never speaking to her again. That is what she should have done. Instead, she said something like, she can never quite remember the actual words, I see how nice for you, or I see how nice of you, 
or just how nice. And when she, the ex-best friend, asked her, had the gall to come out and ask her if she was truly okay with that, because she, the ex-best friend, knew that she still might have some unresolved issues from the divorce. These words she remembered correctly, entirely, as if the ex-best friend were, just now, whispering the sentences into her still-burning ears. She had simply said, of course not. What is there to be upset about? Let bygones be bygones. In the days and weeks that followed, she was most upset about that final phrase she had uttered. Let bygones be bygones. The sheer idiocy of it. As if she were a 10th grade homeroom teacher counseling unruling students after a spat, when she should have stood up for herself. She was a lawyer, goddammit. This was her job. When she should have said what, she, what needed to be said, so she, never, so she would never have to see this bitch again. <laughs> Um, these are the first pages of a novel that I hope to God I'm almost finished with. Um, that's it. Okay. Uh, Thomas goes to the threshold of his bedroom and stops short there, my son barefoot and in his pajama still. He steps back to jump wide over the stain out in the hall, right outside his door, a wide blood stain that no amount of my scrubbing can get out. My other son is at the dresser, and I ask Billy if he wants me to pick something out for him. Nope, he answers as I was expecting. My boys are seven now. My days of getting to pick their clothes are mostly over. So, Billy is at the dresser. Thomas is in the bathroom. I listen for Puccini, and I hear him out in the hall, his nails clicking against the wood as he paces. I like keeping track of my family in this way, imagining the three of them as red dots roaming around a blueprint of our home. And me, I am sitting on the edge of Thomas's bed. I pick his football comforter up from the floor, blue, red, and white, the Giants. Football is something I no longer have the privilege of refusing to care about. I have boys. I'm the mother of two boys. Thomas has pressed me into letting him join an after-school football team next year. And although we can't stay in Connecticut anymore, I assume there'll be a similar kind of thing back in New York. Just the thought of it makes me anxious, though. I smooth the comforter and listen further. And I don't mean I continue to listen. I mean I listen for things that are farther away. The sounds coming in from the open window, the muffled laugh track to whatever our neighbor Shirley is watching on TV, the whoosh of cars on the expressway behind the tangle of woods at the back of our small house. I'll sometimes let myself believe I'm more aware of my surroundings than the average person. Convincing of myself of my own hypersensory is the only way to feel normal at times. After waking up from a dead sleep in the middle of the night, covered in sweat, afraid that one of the many ghouls floating through the nightscape of my past has found me. I'm finished with the bed. I sit down on it and watch, completely arrested as Billy struggles to get out of the white t-shirt he slept in. One of the truly beautiful things about him is the way he has of so complicating even the simplest physical task. I push away the impulse to help him, the need to help, feeling flattened by how much I love him. How something so simple, his thin forearms crossed behind his head as he's trying ridiculously to yank the thing up from the back. How something so simple can inspire in me such intense feeling. But then again, his frustrations, no matter how small, have always belonged to me as well. He finally frees himself, and catching me watching, puts his hands on his hips. Bon d'accord, je pars, I say, as I make for the door. They look like their father, and they move like he did, too. It surprises me to discover how much like him they are shaping up to be, despite the fact that they've never met him and never will. I'd like them to understand how good their dad was, even though I've told them nothing but lies about him. Don't lock the door, I say to Billy as I go. I also pause at the threshold and step wide over the stain. I've tried using hydrogen peroxide on it, but the floor will have to be sanded, I guess, and restained by the owner before the next family can live here. Passing the bathroom, I stop to wrap my knuckles on the door and tell Thomas, make sure this stays unlocked, okay? He doesn't answer. I look down at Puccini, who pushes his snout into my hand, looking for food, maybe, or to be pet. Through the door, I can hear water running into the bath, and I know he didn't answer me only because he couldn't hear. But still, my panic begins to rise. My heart thrums in my chest as I worry that someone's in there. 
I open the door, causing him to start and whine, Mom, sorry, I say as I pull it closed, sorry, just checking on you. In the living room, I tape up a box or put a few books and put a few books inside, but my heart isn't in packing. So I look out the window, or at it rather, at the glass and not what's behind, as I wait for the boys to finish getting ready. I'm taking them out for breakfast. This morning, Thomas spoke to me for the first time in the three days since he saw, saw me shoot someone to death. He asked if we could go to IHOP. I said, yes, of course. Restaurant pancakes are the least I can do. My sons will be grown men when they read this because I'm sure I'll continue to be too much of a coward to talk with them about the difficult things I plan to confess in these pages. I'm writing all of this down as an apology. They're so young still, I don't imagine they give much thought yet to who I am outside of my relationship to them. I come and I pick them up from day camp. I'm late more often than Tori's mom or Daniel's mom, but that's it, that's who they know, and I wish that's who they would have continued to know for longer still. A childhood is all closed up in these leaves of sweet self-centeredness. But if that bud is damaged now, broken open, and they want to know who I am, then here it is. I'm writing all of this down to explain myself. Thomas, Billy, I hope that you didn't spend too much of your childhoods confused by me, resentful, hating me. I hope you can forgive me for what I've done to you. I was well trained in keeping secrets, which is what has kept me alive. But even greater, even more innate than my instinct for self-preservation is how much I love you, and you deserve the truth. MMM, August 1994. The birth certificate issued to Beth Israel read Philip, with the two L's standing side by side, in some small way in memory of the World Trade Center victims, the twin letters erected in the middle of his name. In the years to come, Harper would occasionally regret this decision in the naming of their child. He'd consider again the list that Tori had fixed against the refrigerator sometime in the summer before their son was born. The Walkers and Beckett's and Jackson's, how such, how such names had a hinge within them a sturdy turn on the K, and Harper had grown concerned for Philip by then. It was shortly after his son had turned two, his toddler legs like those long L's, like those twin towers already toppling beneath him. But even when he worried for his child, Harper tended not to lurk too long within the notion that Philip had been faded by his name. Boys, he convinced himself, fall. They fall like Humpty Dumpty, greatly. They fall like Tiki Tiki Timbo tumbling headlong into a well, his rescuers confused by a name made of such a long string of syllables, the firstborn son almost drowning, hardly the most wonderful thing in the whole wide world. But convincing himself, but convincing himself there was nothing wrong with his son was still two years away. Now it was September 18, 2001, and Harper was watching his child emerge into a world where death had just introduced its swift new instruments across the sky. At least it seemed that way, the newness of this destruction, the silvered velocity across all that clear late summer blue. While his child shrieked beneath the heat light of the delivery room, Harper stood helplessly over this strange wet creature laid out on a steel slab and considered his crying part of the brute force of mourning recently unleashed above the city. He'd been hearing it for a full week now, how it buzzed just behind every conversation, like a black static fixed against the background of his life. But then something loosened within Harper in the delivery room. He touched his child, the reddened flesh of him, and the boy pissed with such sudden rare vigor that Harper drew his hand away, alive now as with fire, splattered with his own son's first urine. So sometime later that day, he would say laughing to Tori that perhaps they should name their, him Petite Julianne, after the fountain in Brussels, depicting a little boy peeing. Julianne, it seemed gentle enough against the tongue, Julianne. But Tori was already worrying over the this tiny ravished bean's latch against her breast, the astonished oval of his mouth, poised to unleash great noise anew. In their room within the pediatric ward, the sound of wheels whisked down the hallway grew louder and louder. I knew what Julianne, Tori said, manipulating her nipple with her thumb. 
Amherst College. Yeah? He was a member of the investment club. Water polo? Was he into water polo? Wasn't the type to urinate in public, though. Well, Harper said, this kid is urinating in public whenever he's given the opportunity. Harper, Tori said, don't start, don't start setting the bar too high for him already. He's only a few hours old. Harper watched his son knuckling Tori's breast now. The boy had been born with a damp swath of hair drawn darkly across his skull. Harper had been astounded when he first saw the hair, slick with the slurry of afterbirth like thick rivulets of, rivulets of ink. He tried to imagine it growing inside his wife's body, that, crap black, that cramped black wilderness they'd shared for nine months. But all he spied was the space itself erasing before his eyes. How about Philip then? Harper asked. Philip? Where did that come from? I don't know. He peered down quizzically at his child, his lips attached now, Tori's nipple thickened with the sucking. It looks a little like a Philip. I don't see it. Then again, I don't even see him separate from myself yet. We'll give it a day on a name. The next morning, within an hour of their release from the Beth Israel, Tori consented to naming their son Philip with the two L's twinned within it. There were unconfirmed reports of a rescue crew discovering someone alive beneath the rubble down at the World Trade Center site, and Harper imagined a man emerging into the world through a jagged mall of steel and concrete, the light blinding him. It was shaping up to be a sunny day outside. It was the first turn of autumn beyond the hospital's broad windows, oak leaves loosened in Stuyvesant Square. You could almost believe, Harper thought, you were, weren't even in a city, this city. excerpt from an ever-expanding story entitled, Peanuts Aren't Nuts, because they're not. <laughs> Her father was the first to ask. I need to know, he'd said. I need you to tell me. They were at the kitchen table where he'd summoned her to sit. Later, she'd be asked by her school counselor, by an investigator, by her mother. Her father lowered his chin. Did Mr. Peebles touch you? No, she squealed, violated by the question alone. She closed her eyes and squeezed her knees together. I need, her father said, pupils ablaze, for you to think about what I'm asking. All those times he was here, in this house. Worry lines formed a pleat down the middle of his forehead. No, she repeated, furious that they were talking even indirectly about sex or sex acts, or more specifically, when you got down to it, her genitals. Furious that her own father had and was forcing her to have an image of Mr. Peebles petting them. Did you touch? No, she said again. No, nothing. Never, not ever. Pam had never, not ever, touched anyone's anything. What did she do with Mr. Peebles, her biology tutor? The man hired to help her prepare for the SAT2 <laughs> so she'd be admitted to a prominent college and acquire a prominent job and have a prominent life? Molecules, membranes, evolution. Mr. Peebles with his woolly mammoth mustache and peppermint breath. Mr. Peebles who knew answers to all her life questions. How it was possible that humans shared 60% of their DNA with a banana. Why some earthworms had 10 hearts. He even knew the proper way to say legumes, legumes. Until the word came out of his mouth, she thought it was pronounced legumes. You have to learn your legumes, he'd said, after she'd failed to identify which item on the list was unlike the others. A, soybeans. B, peas. C, peanuts. D, pistachios. Answer, D, pistachios. I don't understand how peanuts aren't nuts, she'd said. They grow on the ground, said Mr. Peebles. Nuts grow on trees. But it's called a peanut, she protested. It's ridiculous. More like nuts, he'd said and tried to subdue his grin. His dimples <laughs> dimpled. She'd rarely seen dimples up close, but had learned from him that the dimple gene was dominant. She sucked the insides of her cheeks and wondered if there was any category in which she was dominant. Did you know, said Mr. Peebles, sniffling the way he did when excited, blinking hard behind his oversized glasses, that the average child eats 1,500 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches before they graduate from high school? Ew, she said. I won't. You're not the average child, he replied. It was the pause that followed, the electrically charged silence, 
and the hasty eye contact and the hastier looking away about which she'd never tell her father. Nor would she tell him that, when, that she'd walked out Mr. Peebles after their last session and teased him about his cobalt Corvette convertible. I thought they only made those in miniature. Excuse me. Or that to squash her apparent skepticism of sports cars, he'd suggested they go for a ride, and she'd agreed. Mr. Peebles had let her pick whatever she wanted to listen to on the radio, one by you two, and crank up the volume as loud as she wanted until she could feel it in the middle of her ear. Was that the cochlea? And Pam, her hair a flapping flag, had secretly sung into the wind, because Bono's crooning wholly swallowed up her own. She didn't tell her father about how they'd wheeled past the basketball courts where the Rudnick brothers happened to be playing, or how Mr. Peebles had greeted the boys with a friendly little salute. Pam's father, who always feared the worst, what kind of idiot would drive a convertible, he'd once scoffed, at the time they were at a stoplight beside one. Pam had gawked at the so-called idiot behind the wheel, a thick-shouldered blonde examining her teeth in the rearview mirror. Imagine, her father had said, what would happen if that car flipped over? Pam did just that. Picture the vehicle airborne and upside down, a whip of yellow hair and black mouth, and the dizzy, bloody crush of concrete plowing into bone. When she and Mr. Peebles glided back in front of her house, volume lowered, skulls intact, Pam had glowered at the beige station wagon in the driveway, the one she'd likely steer when she got her license. Hope it wasn't as bad as you thought, Mr. Peebles had said. He placed his hand over the gear shifter and gave it a squeeze. For whatever reason, Pam didn't get out of the car. <laughs>